I'm Dick Betts, the director of the Salzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. And on behalf of the Institute and the School of International Public Affairs, uh, I want to welcome Admiral Michael Rogers to Columbia and thank him for offering us this opportunity. It wasn't all that long ago that it would have been practically unthinkable uh, for the person in his position to give a public address like this. Uh, and while secrecy is still paramount in much of this business, uh, I think today we'll get a chance to uh, get a little beyond that and, and talk about some of the bigger issues. Uh, the first time I remember entering the portals of uh, NSA at Fort Meade was in my youth working on the staff of the First Senate Intelligence Committee uh, in 1975, and I vividly recall my first impressions. Uh, first, this place is a lot bigger than CIA, <laughs> and then security in this place is a lot tighter than at CIA. Uh, some things haven't changed, uh, but uh, much has, and in only a few decades. Uh, most of the point, none of the students here, I suspect, can remember life without the Internet. Uh, and I suspect few can even imagine anymore trying to live without it. Uh, the overwhelming importance of cyberspace as both a fundamental underpinning of modern life and a zone of conflict uh, has led to a major additional responsibility for the director of NSA as head of the U.S. Cyber Command. And Admiral Rogers is uh, coming to us in that capacity today. Uh, let me now hand over the introduction to uh, Jason Healy, our senior research scholar uh, in SEPA, new this year, specializing in cyber conflict competition and cooperation. Uh, Jay was the founding director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative of the Atlantic Council. Uh, he's editor and co-author of books on the subject. Uh, he's a member of the, he's a rather president of the Cyber Conflict Studies Association uh, and previously taught cyber policy at Georgetown and SICE. Uh, he's director for cyber infrastructure protection at the White House from 2003 to 2005. Worked at Goldman Sachs and uh, in his career in the Air Force, worked on cyber operations. He has degrees from the Air Force Academy, Johns Hopkins and James Madison University. Jay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Columbia. Um, and it's great to see so much of the Columbia community here. I see people from all across the campus. To, to give you the outline of what will happen today, the Admiral will give um, some comments. Uh, then we'll do questions and answers. Uh, we'll, we'll cut right to uh, the Q&A, since we've got so many fantastic people here. Um, now, the part I want to emphasize in Q&A is um, the Admiral will be fantastic on, on the A part of that, the answers, but you actually have to ask a question. Uh, that means it is short and it ends actually in a question mark. Um, I want, to, uh, there will be people with microphones, so please just get my attention and, and I, will, I will call on you and we'll get the microphone to you. I wanted to thank Christian Science Monitor, Christian Science Monitor Passcode, um, who is uh, live tweeting and with us on the video feed. So Admiral uh, Michael Rogers, Commander of U.S. Cyber Command and the Director of the National Security Agency. After graduating from Auburn and Naval ROTC, he started his career as a surface warfare officer before switching to cryptology, which covers the making and breaking of codes and related work. He had served as Director of Intelligence for the Joint Staff as well as U.S. Pacific Command. And most recently before this position, he was the Commander of U.S. Fleet Cyber Command, 10th Fleet. As you'd expect, with a career spanning over more than three decades, he has a distinguished career with jobs ashore and afloat, including leadership of the Joint Chiefs of Staff J3 Computer Network Attack and a Defense Shop, and Special Assistant to the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff and Director of the Chairman's Action Group. He's a distinguished graduate of the National War College, graduate highest distinction from the Navy War College, also a fellow of the MIT Seminar 21, alumni of the Harvard Senior Executive a national security program and holds a Master of Science in National Security Strategy. Admiral right. Rogers. So after that introduction, I'm sure most of you are wondering what does half of what you just heard really mean? So, <laughs> hey, so I've been a sailor for 34 years. Uh, joined the Navy as soon as I graduated from college because it was what I always wanted to do. Always wanted to go into the Navy, didn't come from a military family. And I grew up in Chicago. What brings me here today was first, I wanna thank you for you guys lead busy, professional and personal lives. I want to thank you for willing to spend some time together to have a conversation. Um, because to me, dialogue is important about how we as a nation are going to work our way through some pretty tough and difficult issues. Um, 
I'm really here today, two jobs. As Commander, U.S. Cyber Command, three primary missions. I'm responsible for operating and defending the Department of Defense's networks, so not like, unlike a large company. We have millions of employees that operate around the globe, that operate at multiple classification levels, that operate from the tactical edge of the battlefield to you know, large permanent locations. And U.S. Cyber Command is responsible for tying that all together and operating and defending the networks uh, that we use to communicate and flow information. The second mission for U.S. Cyber Command is the department has made a decision to generate a de dedicated cyber mission force, about 6,200 people. That force, designed to be kind of the high end, if you will, that's going to generate from the defensive to the offensive side for the department. It won't be the only part of the department that's doing cyber, but it's really focused on how do we apply high-end talent, if you will. The third mission for U.S. Cyber Command, and it's a, one reason why I find myself in New York City today, because it's not only to talk to you here at Columbia, but I also spend some time in the business community today, because U.S. Cyber Command's third mission is, if directed by the President of the United States, it's in keeping with DOD's broad mission of defending our nation, it's to apply our cyber capabilities to forestall acts of significant cyber consequence directed against critical U.S. infrastructure. Think about power, water, aviation, financial. Um, those are the three missions for U.S. Cyber Command. So particularly for the last one, partnerships with the private sector are critically important for the ability to execute the mission. As the director of NSA, two primary missions. One gets most of the attention. We are a foreign intelligence organization, a foreign intelligence organization. I don't do domestic surveillance. That is not what the NSA does. We are a foreign intelligence organization. And we operate within a strict legal regime that derives exactly what we do and how we do it in broad ways. In addition to that foreign intelligence mission where we use signals intelligence, if you will, to generate insights as to what nation states, actors, and individuals around the world are doing that's of concern or interest to us, our citizens, or our friends and allies. The, the second mission that NSA does that's becoming increasingly important is NSA has an information assurance mission. Think about cyber defense. We had always been responsible for developing DODs, the Department of Defense, cryptographic and security standards. But increasingly in the last few years, given the dynamic in the cyber arena, we find ourselves now increasingly being called upon to provide our capabilities to assist in the defense of government systems. And the phenomena over the last 18 months or so, to be honest, is increasingly we're being called on to partner with the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, to work directly with the private sector, particularly in response to, to major hacks. So never thought, for example, as a naval officer, I'd be dealing with a motion picture company. But in the aftermath of the hack against Sony, Sony went to the federal government. Federal government said, hey, we have a law enforcement issue here, the theft of intellectual property, in this case, and destruction of property. In this case, it was the theft of Sony's films as well as the Viper malware that the North Koreans used um, to slick the BIOS system associated with Sony's um, desktops. And so that information assurance mission, increasingly NSA finds itself partnering with the public and the private sector to apply our capabilities to help defend um, major companies on the outside as part of a broader government effort. We're not the only one that do it. We work as part of a broader team. And so those are the kinds of missions. And specifically, the reason why I asked to come to Columbia was a couple things. Number one, you, some of you potentially are the workforce of the future for us. And I am interested, as is any ongoing concern in ensuring that we get access to the best minds that we can find. Motivated men and women who want to apply their capabilities to help us in defending the nation, whether you join us as NSA or at, you do that as U.S. Cyber Command. While both organizations have really interesting technology, at their heart, they are organizations that are powered by men and women. And so I am always interested in how can we get the best men and women to be part of the workforce. The other reason, and then I'll shut up so we can um, have a dialogue, because you just don't want me talking at you. Quite frankly, I am interested in a dialogue. You know, one of my frustrations for the last 18 months is I'm watching people talk past each other. And sadly, all this is happening in a broader context. We find ourselves as a society increasingly polarized. 
we are unable to achieve political consensus on you name the issue. We generally increasingly distrust the mechanisms of government. We increasingly can't disagree with each other. We have to fundamentally demonize each other. Hey, there's something wrong with you because you feel differently than I do. Or what is it about you that leads you to believe something fundamentally different? There must be something wrong with you. That is the dynamic that we're dealing with as a society right now if we're honest with each other. And with that kind of dynamic, you can't solve problems because you don't talk to each other. You talk at each other. And I'm interested in a dialogue about, hey, given the challenges we're facing in the world around us, given the way technology is changing, what do we think the right way ahead is for us as a society? And with that, I look forward to your questions. Ian, ask me any question on any topic. Glad to hear that, sir. And um, I'll start taking questions in a second. But it turns out I was just handed this note, and there's a, just a form I have to fill out for Columbia. Um, sorry for this. And it's just uh, the first question is, um, what was your mother's maiden name? <laughs> and, uh, or your favorite school? There you go. Can you give me a... Uh, uh, rats. Okay, you're not going to Not, gonna not going for that. that one. Okay, so that's social engineering, and it doesn't, and it doesn't work. Um, okay, can I, let's, let's, we're just going to go right to the floor and start opening it up. Um, and uh, so first question. Uh, okay, I see back here um, on, uh, on my left. And you can go ahead and if you can start, ca you can continue to catch my eye and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll try and get your position. Okay. And then next is going to be over here. And before you ask, can I do something really quick? This is just a military custom that I always do. Because the first person to ask the question, <laughs> Thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak with us today. I wondered if you could speak at all about the uh, t recent uh, discussions about reorganizing the NSA for the first time in probably over 15 years um, and how you think that will better uh, solve the uh, challenges that we're facing and help the NSA fulfill its mission. So I have, uh, in fact, I brought it up in my last congressional testimony where uh, in response to a question from Senator Feinstein, I talked about, um, well, I've been in the job 18 months now. I've had both jobs for 18 months. And one of the things that I, I told our team was, I believe NSA is the preeminent signals intelligence and information assurance organization in the world right now. But if we do nothing different, if we just keep doing what we're doing now, are we going to be able to say that in five or ten years? And I've always believed as a leader that part of my responsibility is to make sure that whoever comes behind me is going to be able to say, just as I was when I started this job, hey, I think we're the best at what we do. And I want, for, this, for the security of our nation, I want to be able to say that in the future. So I asked the team at NSA, I said, I want you to step back. I gave them 12 specific areas I wanted to focus on from how we grow people, to how we recruit people, to how we're organized, to how we innovate, to how we assimilate technology, to how we develop technology. And we called that the director's charge. We um, spent about 10 months on that. I insisted, hey, this is just not gonna be headquarters in Washington driving this. I wanna hear from the workforce. So we intentionally took a lot of time. Um, I'm in the midst right now of uh, having a, a dialogue with my immediate bosses to make sure they're on board, uh, because while I may be a four-star admiral, I've got bosses just like everybody else, and I want to make sure my bosses um, are aware of what I'm doing, what I'm doing, and why I'm proposing to do it. So I, I apologize. I've, I've told everybody, look, until I, I get my bosses to head nod, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the specifics, because I want to make sure they're on board. But the fundamental really... Um, there were six kind of focus areas that I said should drive whatever we do. I said, what we need to do is make sure whatever we do enhances mission outcomes, generates better outcomes for the nation. That's the only reason to make changes. The second thing I said was, whatever we do, I want to reinforce the idea of accountability. As, as a naval officer, it's just part of the culture I come from. That's always been a big deal for me, that we are accountable as an organization. The third thing that I, I told the team was, whatever we do, I want the outcome to make it easier to partner with us. Because in the end, the future to me is all about the power of partnerships. And NSA traditionally has been a very um, SIGINT focused, technically focused organization, and it tended to optimize itself for 
at times this is simplistic, but the, the comment I used to make was, we need to make sure we're optimizing ourselves to deal with people who don't understand us, don't know us, and we'll make it easier for them, not harder. Because at times we'll use our own lexicon, we use our own structure, we own, use our own terminology. Even within the intelligence business, I, I, and I've been a SIGINT officer, as you heard, for almost 30 years, <laughs> um, I've always been struck at times by the fact that we always assume we're talking to somebody who does what we do for a living and they know exactly what we're talking about, and that's just not the case. Um, and the, the last thing, I apologize, there was one other one, but I'm, I'm blanking out on it. But the other thing that I, I told the team about was make sure that whatever we do, I want to see if we can maximize efficiency and effectiveness. Because look, the, the nation is entrusting us with a significant amount of resources. And we owe it to the nation to make sure we are maximizing the return on those investments. Because the budget is getting smaller. NSA, along with the intelligence community writ large, 2016, the fiscal year that just started on the 1st October, represents our fifth straight year of a declining budget. Mm -hmm. And so I remind people, look, the future is flat to declining budgets. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be growing budgets. And then um, the last piece of it, and I remember, it was about innovation and technology. Mm -hmm. We have got to optimize ourselves to enhance innovation in our ingestion and development of technology. And to do that, again, go back to that partnership idea to me. Um, we've got to do things a little bit differently. We need the outside world in a way we didn't always in the past. I think that's a good thing for us. And, and if I can, um, sure. just for context, because some people might know, who are your bosses? I mean, obviously the president Jack. at the top, but so, who, who signs your OER? As the director of the National Security Agency, NSA is a, it's a part of the intelligence community, but it is a combat support agency within the Department of Defense. So my boss is the director of NSA, is the Secretary of Defense. U.S. Cyber Command, which is a very traditional military warfighting organization in many ways, same kind of construct. We are a sub-unified command, and my immediate boss is a, a fine American named Admiral Cecil Haney, who's the commander of Strategic Command down in Omaha, Nebraska. And he is my immediate boss in that job, although the reality is, given the speed and complexity and the fact that cyber, particularly within the government, is still largely Washington-based. Many times I, I just find myself dealing directly with the, the Washington arena in a way that the organizational chart doesn't necessarily lead, lead, lead you to suggest would be the case. Yeah. And, and if I can do one, one question on that. So you said that NSA does both the signals intelligence mission, but also I think this increasingly important information assurance, mm -hmm. you know, protecting right, right. Um, America's communications and especially DOD's. And I think there's been a, a, um, a feeling maybe in the community that there's maybe more on the signals intelligence than, than, than the information assurance. Certainly, I, I would suspect it's bigger. Is there any thought of, of plussing up the information assurance side on that? And then we'll go to our next question. Well, yeah, I'm going to wait until I uh, announce. Once I get my bosses, I'll yeah. wait and to talk about the specifics. But let me just say one of the things I wanted to drive for was I want to integrate much more how we do intelligence and information assurance. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we tended to treat these as very, we've developed a lot of great expertise, but we built these great cylinders of excellence, and quite frankly, at times, we put stone walls between these cylinders. And my view is that's not going to optimize us for the future, you guys. That, that, that's not going to lead to those mission outcomes I said, number one. Whatever we do should enhance mission outcomes, our ability to support the nation, the ability to meet the needs of our customers, whether that customer be a strategic entity like the President of the United States mm -hmm. or... Um, the very tactical edge of the battlefield. Because that really, for NSA, has always been what I find the, the best part of the job. The customer set for us runs from the senior most leadership of our nation to the junior most warfighter on the edge somewhere mm -hmm. on a convoy or a foxhole sitting in Afghanistan or Iraq. And our job is to try to provide that full spectrum of people with the insights they need to make smart decisions and to ensure the safety of our people and our interests. And uh, when, uh, when you do ask a question, please do introduce yourself uh, with your name and, and, um, uh, and your affiliation of where you're studying. And can, and, uh, can you explain what you presented to the young lady? The, the okay, so in military culture, every major unit creates a coin with a, a, a symbol. Sometimes there'll be a model. And there's a bunch of symbols that in our culture mean something. Um, and so as the director of NSA and the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, uh, each of those organizations, I have a coin. And... You normally give coins in our culture to recognize 
good work or performance, but I also use whenever I, I speak in public, because quite frankly, there, there's always a hesitance to ask the first question. I always just try to give a coin to the first individual and say, hey, I just want to say thanks for your willingness to stand up in front of a bunch of strangers <laughs> and, and ask a question. Great. Thank you. And, and the second question here is the, the young woman in the glasses. Hi, Admiral. Thank you very much yeah. for joining us today. My name is Miki Noguchi. I'm an alumni of SEPA. Um, so interestingly, in your response to the last question, you actually touched upon a lot of the um, tangential or sort of sub-issues of the question that I have. Um, uh -oh, so you met down. This is no, well, I, I wanted to make sure I had my thoughts organized for you in 17 segments. Please yes. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned uh, in one of your in sort of your original opening statement about the private sector and mm -hmm. and and the the use and need of the private sector for the services of the NSA as a parent is a law enforcement as a protector. Um, and sort of the the security of the state, right? And what you can offer them. But I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about a potential role for the private sector in a proactive way mm -hmm. to partner with the NSA, partner with government, um, maybe in a technical capacity or in, as part of a transparency initiative, because that's something I've heard on the private sector side, is that they are also afraid of transparency. Sure. So Great. thank you. So if I could, let me talk about the technology piece first, and then I want to segue into what I think is a very interesting broader potential piece of this. So uh, I remind my workforce at NSA, and it's true for US Cyber Command, at its heart, we are an organization that harnesses the power of technology to defeat technology. And in the end, much of that technology is not something we're going to develop. My view is, to be effective, we need to have partnerships with the private sector that keep us smart about technical development that enable us to provide and share insights with the private sector about, hey, here's what we see going on. Here's the vulnerabilities we have identified. Um, so, um, you know, I think that's an important part of the future, and we've got to make that easier. Um, you know, every organization in the intel community um, takes a slightly different approach to this idea. NRO, the National Reconnaissance Organization, that is the element within the intelligence community in the United States that launches satellites, that runs our constellations on orbit. They represent one extreme, and NSA is probably the other. NRO's model is small number of government employees, I think it's about 5,000, and they turn to the private sector to do almost everything. It's the private sector that designs our satellites, launches our satellites, puts them on orbit, maintains them, and generally operates them as part of contract. And we use government in simplistic terms. And we use the government workforce to identify requirements, to prioritize, to help with the quality control, and to provide oversight. NSA's model historically was always very different, uh, in part because of the sensitivity of the work we do. Generally, our attitude was go out and hire the best mathematicians, the best computer scientists, the best double E's. You bring them in and then we would develop most of our own technology. Most of what we use in our business, quite frankly, we developed inside. Um, my view is I'm not sure that optimizes us for the future. Another reason why I'm interested in the broader partnership is I'm watching two cultures that often talk past each other and think they understand each other. So when I ask my workforce sometimes, simplistically, so I'm going to paint a broad brush so uh, this isn't true for everybody. You know what, what some in my workforce will say when I ask them, tell me how you would describe your counterparts in Silicon Valley. What, what, what's the way you would describe them? And a lot of times I'll get with, hey, they're all about money. And I'll go, interesting. If you ask somebody in the Valley what their self-image is, we are using technology to change the world for the better. Mm -hmm. That is the self-image in the valley. That's a good thing for the nation. It's a good thing for us as a world. Likewise, when I'm out in the valley at times, and I'll ask, so tell me how you would characterize NSA's workforce. What's the image that comes to mind when you think about us? And <laughs> sometimes I'll get, oh, well, you have the workforce we didn't want to hire. <laughs> and I'll say, hmm. Then explain to me, for example, why you are freaking actively recruiting right now across everywhere that I have a major workforce element, you're snapping them up like there's no tomorrow. So who are we kidding here about, well, this is the workforce we didn't want to hire? 
So I watch two cultures at times. They each think they understand the other, but they really don't. And so one of the reasons I'm interested in more partnerships is because I want each of those perspectives to be informed more by personal observation and experience than ignorance. And so I'm interested in creating an environment over time where I can use government employees to work for us for a while and then go out and work in the commercial sector for a while and then come back. I'm interested in an environment where I can take the private sector and say, how'd you like to come work for us as an intern for 12, 18, 24 months? And I'll give you a problem set where I think your, your abilities are well suited. And I'll give you a problem set that I think will generate insight that will give you the benefit of experience and insight when you go back to your company. Now, I'll, I'll also remind people, we gotta meet security clearance requirements here because the nation entrusts us with very sensitive data and information. And there's a process we all go through before we're given access to any of that. And I expect every employee to be able to do that. So I remind the partnerships, hey, so we've got to be able to pass clearances. Um, likewise, I'm interested in, which is not the government model at all, I run into a lot of people in the private sector who will say to me, you know, sir, my kids are older. I made a lot of money. I loved what I did out here. But I'd really like to maybe try to give back. I'd like to get in to a government structure for a little while and see what I can do to apply my capabilities to help defend the nation. But the way we're optimized right now, that is really hard. Because we're very much, you come in at the bottom, you work your way up to the top. Um, that's not a model that scales well to bring people in. So I'm trying, again, it's part of those changes that I'm trying to work on that you'll hear more about uh, in the future. But it goes back to that power of partnership. And it's true for Cyber Command. If you read, and then I'll shut up because I'm taking too long to answer your question, I apologize. If you read the DOD cyber strategy, unclassified documents, second one we've done, it's on the web and the DOD website. We just released it in April of 2015. In there, we talk specifically about five broad goals or five tenets that will underpin how we're gonna move ahead in the cyber arena. And one of those five is all about the power of partnerships and how we need within the department to do things a little differently, both in terms of our ability to harness technical capabilities, but as well as workforce exper expertise. So it's not unique to NSA. I think it's pretty foundational to the DOD writ large in the future. Great, and uh, next here is, uh, I saw this gentleman here in the kind of purple shirt, and then after that, we're going to go to the, to the woman here. Uh, thank you so much for coming in hey, to us. My name is Barack. Hey, Barack. Um, first sergeant in reserve in the IDF and a student in Colombia. Ah. Um, it is argue uh, what are the balance between national security and privacy. This is an arguable uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. But one discussion is less arguable is whether you can both judge yourself and execute commands. Because you can, hold. I apologize. Can you? I, I, yeah. I didn't get. Could you repeat the last part of it? Come yeah, on. do you want to talk without the microphone? No, 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 please. No, All with right. the microphone. Um, just repeat the. In democracy, you have a separation between judgmental boroughs and executive and laws. Okay. In your organization, you have both the court and the body who execute the commands. Do you think you're capable of judging your own decisions inside the organization without uh, exposing? other parts yeah. in the government, yeah. your process of decisions? Great. Check. So, and I think in general, over, you know, both in oversight and, and how we know right. we're doing the right things. So I'll, I'll talk about... Or do you need more oversight? Right. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll talk about it more broadly. So the first point I would make is the court is not in my chain of command. They don't work for me. I don't work for them. In our government, they're in the judicial branch, totally separate, independent. We created a structure as a government in which we put a creative tension into our very framework. We created three different branches and we structured our legal framework in the form of the Constitution to explicitly make change difficult. Because to drive change, you have to get consensus generally across multiple segments of those three branches. Sign to that we in the United States in our history, we talk about it as the whole idea of checks and balances. So within the US legal framework, um, you know, the legal framework I use with U.S. Cyber Command is whatever evolutions we execute are done in accordance with international law and the law of armed conflict. 
And that's true whether we're doing, as a military, something kinetic, dropping a bomb, or we're doing something non-kinetic, launching a software program designed to achieve an offensive effect, if you will. Our legal framework is we're going to use the same broad construct. It has to be done with a legal framework. It has to be proportional, and it has to be very discreet, very specific. We use that same process when we think about dropping conventional ordinance. Our view is we're going to do the same thing when it comes to the application of force in the cyber arena. On the NSA side, NSA has one executive order and four laws, if you will, that are the legal basis for what NSA does. Each of those laws in the executive order are, are a little different, but I'll, um, because you focused on the court, I'll talk about the, 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 the broadest one that really goes to where we have to go to a legal a court, a court to get approvals. So under US law, for NSA to do focused collection against a US person, number one, it is illegal for us to collect a US person in the United States. It is illegal for NSA to collect against a US person in the United States. To collect against a US person outside the United States, I must make the following case to a judge. I must convince the FISA court that the individual is acting as an agent of a foreign government or power, not as a US citizen, but they have become an extension of a foreign government or, or, or a group. And then in addition, I have to make the case to the judge that there's reasonable grounds to believe that the individual is involved in one of about six different categories of behavior. Proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, counterterrorism, efforts against US computer systems, efforts against um, US military. Laura, you're gonna kill me, Emily. There's one more. I, I apologize, I always miss one. But there's a, a specific legal basis. We just can't indiscriminately say, hey, today is Tuesday and We'll go after everyone whose name starts with a J. It doesn't work that way. You've got to go to a judge, and we've got to make a specific first, legal First case. name or last name starts with yeah, a J. There you go. <laughs> so you've got to convince a judge. And then the judge, again, I'm talking about a specific scenario, focus collection against US persons. And then the judge grants us authority to collect against that individual using specific selectors or terms for a specific purpose for a specific period of time. And then if I want to go beyond that period of time, I got to go back to the judge again and make another case about why I think we should still be allowed to do it. Now, if you look at the total level of collection that NSA does, what we do that's focused on, targeted on US persons, it's like single digits. I mean, it is really incredibly low numbers out of our total mission. But it's the part that, as a result of the environment the last couple of years, tended to be an area that got a lot of attention in particular. So we, um, let me do one other one. So I talked about one of those laws. That um, talks about how we collect against, targeted collection against US persons overseas. The other one, and that, this really was the immediate focus in the aftermath of the revelations. What got the most attention was the call data record program, or section 215 of the Patriot Act. Section 215 of the Patriot Act, the government, um, through a court, was able to go to the three largest phone providers in the United States and say, we want you to give us the call data records that you have. What's a call data record? Number a call is originating from, number that the call went to, date the call originated, time the call originated, and when the call ended. So that gave you where the call started, where it ended, how long, and when it occurred. What was not in that? No content. No content. Had no clue what was being said. No names. Had no clue whose phone it was. All I knew was the numbers. Um, so if I, I use my own personal experience, so it could have been one of my kids in my house, it could have been my wife, it could have been a neighbor, it could have been somebody who was in the house because we were having a social event. I don't know, and it was a number here and where it ended. Now, step back, why did we do this? In the aftermath of the 9-11 event, you know, which this city lived very directly, a day in which we lost almost 3,000, and they weren't just Americans, we lost a cross-section of global citizens here in New York City, at the Pentagon, and in a field in Pennsylvania when that United flight, you know, went into the ground. 
In the aftermath of 9-11 and the investigation, one of the hijackers was a known Al-Qaeda individual who had entered the United States without us knowing it. When he entered the United States, he started flight training in Southern California to learn how to fly a commercial airliner. During his training, he ended up placing a call, uh, more than one, he ended up calling back to some known bad numbers overseas in the Middle East. Because the legal framework at the time we didn't have access to any of the records. In the aftermath of 9-11, the 9-11 Commission said, can't we come up with a framework where the government can come up with a means to try to see if there's overseas foreign terrorist activity that's tying directly into the United States? That was the premise of the whole thing. Um, that was probably the most controversial in the aftermath. Um, in the initial review, the president then said, um, I wanted to add one other protection here. What he talked about in January of 2014 was, I've reviewed what NSA does. It is fully compliant with the law. But because I want to make sure there's no potential for abuse, I'm going to put an additional protection in. And the protection the president directed we do was, so you went to the court to the first time to go to the phone company to get the data. Now I want you to go to the court a second time. And I don't want you to access the data without a second court order. And in the second court order, I had to go to the judge and convince the judge I have a spe specific selector, we call it. Think about a phone number or an identifier. I have a specific selector. It's tied to a specific individual. And I can make a case that that individual is tied to a terrorist group. That's what I had to convince the judge. So what could we not do? I could not not go to the judge, for example, and say, I think there's a terrorist cell in Los Angeles. That's all I know. I want access to every area code in the LA basin. That's illegal. We're not allowed to do that. We had to tell the judge, very specific, a specific number to a specific person who we can make the case was tied to a specific group that wanted to do harm to the United States. And that's the way we've been doing this now for uh, about the, coming up on two years now. But in the summer of 15, several months ago, the legal authority, Section 215 of the Patriot Act, expired. It was only a law that was written um, to go into effect through the summer of 15. So we just spent a, a period of time as a nation, your elected representatives, with a discussion about, are we comfortable with that framework? Should we change that framework? What's the right answer? How do we meet the balance of privacy with the desire to ensure that we're forestalling activity that's happening overseas, that's coming into our nation. And so the decision was made to pass a law, it was passed this summer, it goes into effect on the November the 29th. Mm. So I'm very busy at the moment, we are very busy at the moment, implementing the new legal structure so I can provide to the court and the Attorney General and the Congress, your elected representatives, that we are fully compliant with the law and we've switched to the new system. And in that new system, we, NSA, will no longer hold any of the data. We will go to the phone companies with a court order, and we will give the phone companies that initial query. Hey, I need you to check your database against this number that I have, told, I have convinced the judge is a specific number tied to a specific individual who I have given the judge probable cause to believe is associated with the terrorist group. And then we'll give that number to the phone company. The phone company will query their database, and then they'll come back to us. Now, it'll be slower. It'll be more expensive. but. It still gives NSA access to the data, and I hope it generates more confidence in the citizens that we defend that, hey, look, you should feel comfortable with what we're doing, that there's a reasonable level of separation and oversight here. Great, thank you. And uh, let's go, I'll go to my, my let's left go here. On the left. My, uh, to my left here, second row. Second row, can you put your hand up, please? And I'm going to take two questions at a time. So one, and then second so you can here, so stage. Uh, about uh, fifth, fifth row back with the white shirt. If you can just go ahead and give the mic now, and then I'll take bo both questions at, at, at once. Hi. Please go Hi, ahead. my name's Muna Habib. I'm a master's student at um, the journalism school at Columbia. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, how big a threat is cybersecurity really? I mean with some people that I've spoken to in Washington, they think it's all propaganda generated by um, defense contractors trying to win <laughs> some of I your... I apologize for laughing. Yeah. So I just wanted to know how real is the threat? I mean, okay. in England, we aren't being threatened by cybersecurity. I mean, I don't think other... It always seems to be around America. 
So I just wondered how big a threat it really was. Well, he wants to wait till the second question, but then yeah. I'll, I'll come okay. back. And then, okay, and then second. Yeah. Hello, my name is Yoon Hyun Kim. I'm a first year MIA student in SIPA. Uh, my focus is more on interstate, interstate conflict in the cyber field. Right. And um, so uh, the, term, the term of offensive strategy in the event pamphlet brought me to be here because uh, for a long time, I've heard of the uh, weekly press statement from a Chinese foreign ministry that mm -hmm. countries should respect the traditional international laws in the cyber field, that kind of thing. So uh, I just wondering, in this context, could you explain, uh, uh, could you explain the concept of offensive strategy in a more detailed uh, manner, please. Okay. Thank Jack. you. So I'm going to start with that first because I'll remember it, but I promise I'll come back. First, I'd step back and ask both nations start with a fundamentally different premise about the Internet. The United States position is the Internet is a global commons that has generated broad good for the world and our nation, and that goodness has in no small part been engendered by the fact that we viewed it, if you will, as international cyberspace beyond the government's control. China and other regimes, they're not the only ones who, who advocate this, say, hey, now wait a second. Our view is the internet and the web should be viewed as an extension of the sovereign state. Mm. And therefore, just as a sovereign nation, I have the legal basis to ensure the security of my citizens on the land, the air, and the sea. I should be able to do the exact same thing in the cyber domain. Um, so we come at this, if you just look at China and the US, we come at this from two very different fundamental premises. Mm -hmm. Our view is it shouldn't be the role of the government to control the dissemination of information. Again, other nations, China has a different view. Hey, they view it very differently. With the application of force, the offensive piece, in broad terms, our position has been the application of force, number one, should be viewed largely as an extension of the nation state. So a very Westphalian model. That you, this is not something you want to put out in the private sector where individual companies, for example, are just unilaterally deciding how they want to inflict damage on other competitors or other nations. Um, we have argued we should apply force in this domain in the same construct we use to apply force in the others. It should be done within a lawful con construct. We use the, the international law and the law of armed conflict in the other domains. It should use the same broad tenets of proportionality. What do I mean by that? So somebody shoots someone, the answer isn't I drop a nuclear bomb, being very simplistic to show an extreme. Under international law, the appropriate response is not, no, I'm going to drop a nuclear weapon on you. That's the idea of proportionality. And then very discreet, hey, you should only apply offensive capability against those who, in simplistic terms, generated the capability against you in the first state, in the first place. So we have a you know, difference of opinion. Our, our view is, hey, look, we're operating and we want to operate within the broad no legal norms that are the, that are the the standard for most of the world. Other nations, different view, um, view the whole internet more broadly. So I hope that answers your question. To go to your question, um, well, um, the first point I would make is, as a guy who partners very extensively with my partners in the United Kingdom, whether it's GCHQ, MI5, MI6, um, there's plenty of challenges you're dealing with as a nation right now in terms of penetrations of UK industry and the theft of, of intellectual property. It's not something unique to the US, although, we're the largest economy in the world, so it's not surprising to me that we've got a, a pretty good effort directed a, against our economy. Um, and it's not surprising in some ways to me, or not unexpected, I guess would be the way I'd phrase it. Um, I will only tell you the last few years ha have seen that I would argue the largest, and my predecessor talked about this, you know, the largest non um, or illegal or theft-based mm -hmm. shift of intellectual property we've probably ever seen. I mean, we're talking the tune to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars of knowledge and insight that's been developed in the private sector that is being stolen from their systems and given to other nations to use. 
It's not, that's not a new phenomenon. Economic espionage has been happening as long as man's been around. The cyber de uh, arena, on the other hand, gives you the ability to do it on a just um, unbelievable scale. And one of the arguments that we have had, and it kind of ties back to your question about what are some of the legal framework differences between how nations look at this mission set differently, we have made the argument with our Chinese counterparts and others that number one, we want a strong relationship with you. It's in, the nation, it's in our respective nation's best interest, it's in the world's best interest, that two powerful nations like ourselves be able to work in an effective way together, in which we deal with challenges in a way that generate outcomes that are of benefit to both of us, that don't lead to conflict. That, that's not, we argue, in either of our best interests. Mm -hmm. The specific issue in cyber we've had with the Chinese is our argument has been you are using the power of the nation state to steal intellectual property, economic espionage, to provide your private sector with a competitive advantage. Now, that's a reflection of our structure. In the United States, we have these huge firewalls between what is a government function, what is a private sector function, and what's appropriate for the individual or private citizen. And we really, our legal framework is set up to create very tight controls and restrictions in simple terms. And so, uh, put another way, a, from a foreign intelligence perspective, I am the first to acknowledge that our nation is very interested in the development of advanced military technologies around the world. Why? Because we're concerned they potentially could be used against us or our friends and allies. So we want to try to understand them. So we generate insights on those advanced military technologies that are being developed around the world. But the flip side is, I don't then take that knowledge that I gain as the director of NSA and go to the US private sector, pick a company, Lockheed, Boeing, and say, let me show you what the fighter aircraft Nation X is developing is gonna look like in five years. And this is what you're gonna have to compete against. So you need to build something that's better than this. We just don't do that. Our system puts this firewall in. Now you can argue is that good or bad? For us, we've argued it's generated better outcomes historically for us as a nation and I would argue by extension given the power of our economy, the power of our innovation, what the nation partnering with others has been able to develop, it's probably stood us in, in pretty good stead. But there are some who argue, well why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. But if I can pick up the point for a second, and then we're going to go uh, to the gentleman here with the strack hairs, and then to the, to, to the end here for the next two questions, and then, um, if I can pick up a point, we've been talking about a digital Pearl Harbor since 1991, this testimony to Congress. So it's been almost um, 35 years, of the 75 years since the actual Pearl Harbor, that we've been talking about this, and it hasn't happened yet. What about I mean, OPM? I'm sorry? What about OPM? <laughs> well, that, I mean, no one's died yet, at least that I can find in, in our research. So we've had these big espionage, but we've been resourcing this, we've been talking about this as if this big strike's gonna be happening, and we haven't, it hasn't happened yet. So I can understand people saying- I would respectfully a disagree a little bit. So you can argue about yeah. scale, yep. but Sony, where we had a nation state penetrate Sony motion picture entertainment, steal their films, mm -hmm. steal all of their, intellectual, all their internal emails, their corporate salary system, for example, post it to the web and then launch a Viper malware that destroyed the BIOS system and slicked their laptops, their desktops, to the tune that, according to Sony's estimates, cost them something approaching $300 million. This isn't something theoretical, folks. This is something very real and it has happened. If you don't like that example, use Aramco in the Arabian Gulf two years ago where, um, in this case, an actor launched a destructive program that was designed to take the Saudi National Oil Company. They were trying to do two things. Number one, forestall their ability to actually extract petroleum from the ground. Um, and then secondly, destroy their ability to execute their business processes. They managed to destroy, again, through a, a program that destroyed the BIOS system and slicked um, thousands of laptop computers and cost Aramco in the tens of millions of dollars. So I'm not trying to argue the sky is falling, but to sit here and say, well, this isn't really something real. We've been talking about this. I'm like, nah, it's not. If you step back, that's not true. Now, you've never heard me use the phrase digital Pearl Harbor because it's one that I don't really like because what I'm struck by about Pearl Harbor is two things. Number one, it was a, 
at least theoretical, bolt out of the blue, totally unexpected. And my attitude is the world we're living in right now, is anybody surprised by what's going on in the cyber environment that we're dealing with? I'm not surprised by it. So the analogy of a bolt out of the blue I don't think is a good one. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Pearl Harbor invokes this image of people dying in the thousands. Mm -hmm. um, and while there will be destruction, it won't necessarily be, I hope not, right. you know, in, in the human dimension. So the, the, the way I tend to describe it is, look, I fully believe that in the near term, we will see destructive acts of significant consequence directed against our private sector and against critical infrastructure in the United States. I believe that. And my argument would be, and I can show you where I've seen this happen, and I can show you where I'm watching nation states develop this capability. I certainly hope it never happens. And we're spending a lot of time focused on how do we talk to and convince nation states you don't want to do that, that's not in your best interest, that that it would lead to outcomes that aren't good for you and aren't good for us. And, and I would think it would get more deadly the more we do Internet of Things and the more that we use Yeah, the, the re another reason, uh, let me riff for just one minute, the Internet of Things. Uh, another thing I often tell people is, look, things are going to get worse before they get better. Yeah. Why? Because the very technical foundations of the world we're creating are leading to more interconnectivity down to a level we have never seen before. In, you know, my lifetime, an automobile was a mechanical entity that was designed to move me from point A to point B that was almost totally mechanical and the only remote device in the vehicle was a one-way receive only. We called it the radio. <laughs> That's all a car was. You look at an automobile today in the systems we're all driving, it is now a series of interconnected software and hardware capabilities that are constantly bringing information in and pushing information out at a level that we as drivers have no clue. <laughs> that represents a huge potential set of vulnerabilities. And we are looking in the near term, in our immediate lives, we're going to see unattended vehicles driving on the roads in significant numbers. So the very, you know, world that we're creating for ourselves, and don't take from this that, is Admiral Rogers saying that the Internet of Things is bad? Nope. It's going to bring us amazing convenience. It's going to give us the ability to bring together processes in a way we've never done before. But we've got to go into it with our eyes open. It also represents potentially significant vulnerability. Great. Thank you, Admiral. And here, and then I'm going to go over to the end here. You can give, go ahead and give the mic now. Good afternoon, sir. My name's Nick. Hey, I'm Nick. a second year sweep student. Um, my understanding is that the NSA stockpiles a healthy amount of zero-day vulnerabilities for future operations. My question is, if you were to disclose more or most of those vulnerabilities to the private sector, do you think that you could tip the offense-defense balance towards defense and protecting intellectual property? So first question, tell me how, what percentage of vulnerabilities that we're aware of do you think we disclose to the private sector? Yes, tell me what you think a number would be. <laughs> Uh, honestly, just give 30%. me what you think, 30%. You know what the actual number was in 2015? 91%. Now, that's in part because the, um, the administration is very direct. Hey, it is our government's policy that a strong, well-defended Internet is in our best interest and that strong and secure systems are in our nation's best interest. And so the, the president is in very direct. Hey, the bias that I want you to tend to move to is disclosure. Now, we've also been very, and we've created a, a process in the interagency now where we review that so that I, as the director, for example, just don't unilaterally decide, well, I want to disclose this, but I don't want to disclose that. We actually created a, a process that involves outside NSA where I tee these issues up and a broader set of people across the government take a look and we come to a collective decision about what we're going to do. Um, I'm the first to acknowledge we have been very direct about saying there are some things we believe it is in our nation's best interest not to disclose. I don't pretend that for one minute. But I also say let's step back, take the emotion out of this, and deal with fact. 91% of the vulnerabilities we became aware of we disclosed. Um, now, I'm, don't get me wrong, you can, some people argue, oh, why is it 100%? You know, my view is, hey, look, there's a good balanced reason why we don't do that in 100% of the cases. We sit there and we ask ourselves, how widespread is this vulnerability? Is it very narrow? If it were to be used by others, what would the potential impact be? Is it used by only certain specific actors of particular concern to our nation? 
Is it widely used? Is it only used by governments? Is it used across the private sector, for example? I mean, those are some of the things that we'll physically walk through as part of, excuse me, as part of the discussion. And what I love about that is those are public policy questions in a public policy process. You know, the, you know coming up with those questions, it's not technical at all, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a way, you know, as a White House default of saying we're going to release these unless there's a strong reason. And I think that really gets to this, it not just being about signals intelligence and technologists, but it fits in this, right. into this larger public policy framework. And again, it's one of the reasons why I'm here, because we've got to have a discussion as a nation about what are we comfortable with. And you don't want me making that decision. As a nation, we collectively got to decide how are we going to do it. Because in our structure, we have two imperatives, and we've got to do both. The right of the individual to feel that the power of the state is not going to be applied indiscriminately against them is foundational to what America is. It's what was our founding premise. Those bastards in London aren't going to tell me what I can and can't do. They're not going to enter my home whenever they want. They're not going to send their military to occupy my country. And they're not going to tax me whenever they want without my input. That was the fundamental driver for 240 years ago when we became a nation. At the same time, that amazing document, the Constitution, that talks about that fundamental premise, it also talks about the need for the government to ensure the security and well-being of the citizens that it serves. And so we're trying to figure out, I think, collectively as a nation, how do we meet these two imperatives, realizing that they both are critical. It ain't one or the other. It's not one's more important than the other one. It's what do we think is the right way to meet both these imperatives? Yeah. And how do we do that in a world in which the technology that we now all are counting on is fundamentally changing? Yeah. Great. And I'll go to, go to my left here. Thanks. Uh, David yep. Johnstein, Faculty in Political hey, John. Science. Um, I wonder if I could just go back to China for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the last three years under the current leadership, uh, as I think we all know, China's been increasingly Can you vigorous. closer to the mouth, please? Just closer to the mouth, please. Just closer. Yeah, Try okay. to swallow. China's been, <laughs> China's been increasingly <laughs> vigorous in trying to, def trying to uh, 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 limit its own population's access to internet. Right. You touched on that very briefly in passing. I just wonder if I could ask you uh, two quick questions about that related to each other. One is, do you have a sense? It's really one question. Do you have a sense of, you know, can you estimate how effective you think China has actually been in that mm -hmm. effort? And do you? have any prognosis on whatever grounds, technological, political, social, about how effective that effort is likely to be in the coming years? So the first comment I would make is they have the mo among the most systematic, well-structured, comprehensive efforts I've seen of any government in the world to control the access of their citizens to information. Now you can argue if that's good or bad, um, I, I leave it to our Chinese teammates to decide if that's appropriate or not. It's certainly in our society and our culture is not. We would view that as, you, you, again, go back to that first imperative. You're violating the rights of our citizens and you're harnessing the power of the government to forestall their ability to share information, to communicate freely, to voice opinion, et cetera. Um, in terms of uh, effectiveness, you know, it clearly um, has an impact. The long-term argument to me, and I could well be wrong, is in the long run, a strategy, and I would say this to, to any nation, in the long run, a strategy that's predicated on the use of technology to attempt to forestall um, a population's ability to achieve inputs from a broader range of sources, I, I don't think has a high probability of success in the long run. Because in the end, I've just always been a believer, technology designed by man, invented by man, can be defeated by man. Um, and you know, you look at the power, look at our own society, the power of innovation, what Silicon Valley and the IT segment in the United States is, a, is able to produce, the breakthroughs, the insights, the ability to collaborate. It, it, it's among the things I would argue we ought to be proudest of as a nation. It is truly amazing to me. Um, it is leading to fundamental change. We're in the middle of it, so you don't recognize it as much. But the level of knowledge that is being generated and shared within the world today is greater than the history of the planet. We take it for granted because it's, for most of you, 
Um, how many of you are under 25? How many of you are under 30? So probably, you know, for those of us who are a little north of 30, um, quite frankly, we remember a world before the internet. We remember a world before portable handheld digital devices. Hell, I'm, I'm, I'm 56 years old. I remember a world before color television, before cable, let alone the internet, um, you know, multimedia, multi-digital formats. Um, so we tend to take it for granted. But the technical changes that we're going through, the pace of them is just, I would argue, really unparalleled. Man's dealt with significant technical change before. It's not something new to the human condition. But the rate of change and the breadth of the change is, to me, what makes this current environment so different in some ways than what we've seen historically. And, and I'd like to close out as we're, as we're getting, toward, getting towards time. You've talked about the kind of workforce that you're looking to create, and, and you mentioned the, the 6,000 and change mm -hmm. that you're, you're looking to bring on. Um, we're here with all of Columbia represented here. I, I see you know, journalists and lawyers and international affairs and computer scientists. And so as you're looking to do that, what do you see the role of universities? What, is, what are you looking for as you're bringing in, not just within the Department of Defense, but to the broader U.S. government cyber community. Um, what skills are you looking to bring in, and, and how do they find you, and how do you find them? So I'll make a couple points. One thing I always tell universities, and if you just, boy, do the last two weeks. In the last two weeks, I have spoken at Berkeley, Pitt, Carnegie Mellon, the National War College, and now today in Columbia. It just worked out that way, because again, I think engagement and dialogue is an important part of my job. One of the reasons I do that, though, is I'm also interested in talking to universities about how can you be an engine of change that helps us deal with this changing world. That it's about more than just technology. That it's also, you are creating a large segment of the human capital that we're going to use selfishly for me. As I said in the very beginning, um, universities are producing much of the human capital that I want to apply to execute our missions as NSA and US Cyber Command. So I have a vested interest in talking to universities about, hey, so what are the skill sets, what are the backgrounds, what are the kinds of things that we think we need? And we're competing with the, in the private sector for the same workforce. Um, another thing I think universities can do is I always talk to them, um, and so for example, after this, I'll be talking um, to some faculty, because one of the things I do is I want to talk to students, but I also want to talk to faculty about how can universities help us generate insights about what this world of cyber is going to look like. If you go back to the start of the nuclear age and the aftermath of the events of August 1945, it was the academic world that played a big part in how we developed nuclear deterrence theory. Most people tend to think about Henry Kissinger, for example, as the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor. Go back and read his stuff in the 1950s when he was at Harvard, for example, and he wrote about deterrence, strategic deterrence of the nuclear world. Nobody remembers that now because they all view him as this statesman. And I'm not arguing he's not a statesman. But the, some of the work that he did, you know, 60 years ago was really foundational to us as a nation and as a world trying to understand, so how are we going to apply theories of deterrence in a nuclear world. I argue I'm interested in the same thing. How does deterrence, norms of behavior, what are the broad organizational and policy drivers that we need to be thinking about in this world of cyber? And I think universities can play a big role in that. In addition to the technical work they do, I, I just think the interdisciplinary thinking broader approach. If you use me as an example, so I am the senior cyber guy in the Department of Defense. If you look at my formal education, my undergraduate degree is in business, and my master's degree is in national security studies. And yet, I, I've been doing intelligence work for 30 years. I've been doing cyber work for coming up on 15 now. It's an area where through experience and, and study, um, you know, I, I, I was comfortable with, and I always tried to put a lot of thought into, because I thought it was foundational to the future. And I never felt that the fact that, ooh, Rogers, you don't have a undergraduate or master's degree in computer science or electrical engineering. Boy, that means you're not posed 
well positioned to be a part of the future and about the dialogue in all this. And I thought, I don't agree with that at all. I want a workforce that's multidisciplinary that brings multiple perspectives and multiple backgrounds to bear here. I don't want a bunch of cookie cutters where everybody is, all I want is computer scientists, data engineers. If you don't have that skill set, you're not applicable to us. I, I don't believe that. I, I reject that notion. So. so and, and how do they find you? How do they find uh, Cyber Command, NSA? Well, I mean, do they go through USA Jobs? Or is there a so there's a couple ways to do it. Um, <laughs> Ooh, I was first, I was be in, uh, you want to go to NSA's website? You want to go to US Cyber, Cyber Command's website? So just put NSA or US Cyber Command in your nice search engine. It'll kick you to our um, unclassified website. Look at our website. You'll see there's a segment in there called, so you want to be part of the NSA team? Do you want to be part of the US Cyber Command team? Just like any major company does. We uh, post some jobs in the more traditional arenas, particularly in specific specialties. Um, we aggressively recruit in universities around the United States. We do a, a large number of intern programs, for example. Um, one of the things is part, to go to your first question, young lady, one of the parts of our strategy we're talking about is I want to do a whole lot more of internships. Our return on internships right now approaches anywhere depending on what skill set. It's something like 60 to 75% of the people who intern with us become long-term employees for us. Because our experience is once you get a feel for what our missions are, once you get a feel for our culture and our ethos, most of our interns really want to become part of it and, and aggressively try to apply for jobs with us. Um, so I'd like to continue that investment. With that, I know we gotta go. Let me conclude by just saying what I started with. I wanna thank you for your willingness to sit down and have a dialogue. Hey, I don't expect all of us to agree with each other. I accept that as the natural order of life in a complicated world. As I tell my own children, uh, you know, a couple of whom are some of the age of you in the, in the room, if you can't learn to live in a world in which others based on a different set of experiences and a different perspective, come to different conclusions and feel every bit as strongly about their view of the world as you do, if you can't learn to live in a world like that, you have no success in a future, sons. You have got to learn what it means to live in a world in which different people are gonna have different opinions and different perspectives. And you gotta figure out how you're gonna get smart on what shapes those perspectives, what leads them to believe the way they do, and not make this about, well, you're bad because you don't agree with me. Mm -hmm. Or I'm bad because I don't have the same viewpoint as you. Look at what that is doing to us as a society right now. That is not a good place for us to be. Okay. This is a complex world with a lot of hard problems. And we need to come together as a society to figure out what are the answers to those hard problems. Thanks very, very much. Thanks. Appreciate your guys' okay. time. Thanks.